Hi, everyone. Welcome to Poet to Poet. I'm Rada Markham, and today I have the pleasure of talking to poet Sasha West, who is most recently the author of How to Abandon Ship. Uh, before I introduce you to Sasha, I'd like to invite you to become a subscriber of the Poet to Poet newsletter on Substack if you aren't already. Just go to poettopoet.substack.com and subscribe for free. In it, you'll find interviews like this one, plus helpful ideas on writing and publishing books of poetry. So again, today I am thrilled to introduce you to Sasha West. Sasha West is the author of Failure and I Bury the Body, which was published in 2013, and How to Abandon Ship 2024. Her first book was awarded the National Poetry Series, a Texas Institute of Letters First Book of Poetry Award, and a Breadloaf Writers Conference Fellowship. Recent poems have appeared in American Poetry Re Review, Ecotone, Agni, Kenyan Review Online, Georgia Review, and the anthology The Long Devotion, Poets Writing Motherhood. Her collaborative multimedia shows with visual artist Hollis Hammonds have been exhibited at the Columbus College of Art and Design, Texas A&M, Art Prize 2023 Michigan, and elsewhere. She is an associate professor of creative writing at St. Edwards University, where she runs the Environmental Humanities Program. So Sasha, welcome. I'm so glad to be here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Me too. Me too. Um, so I'd love to start with the book's themes, um, which include climate change and other other challenges that we face, um, quote unquote, the compounding catastrophes of our time. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just curious, where did this book start for you? And did you set out to write a thematic book? Um, it really started with, it started with something that I felt like I couldn't contain in my life, which is in 2013, the IPCC report that came out that year was the first time that I sort of realized not only is my sense of what climate change could do spreading, not only are scientists finding more and more things that this is going to impact, um, but also I had started to see how each report was too, too cautious and that reading reports, report after report, I was finding that the things that people, that the scientists were saying were going to happen later in the future were happening sometimes even before the next report came out from the UN. And that felt really terrifying because I had just had a child. And so suddenly I was sort of understanding, oh, this is this is outside of me, this is happening, the things that I thought I understood stood about it are completely changing. Um, it was also a time when there was a lot of silence, like that was one of the sort of um, pinnacles of polarization around this issue, the pinnacles of silence. And so I was just standing inside of this, feeling like, I have more information about this than a lot of people I know because I've been following it for so long, and yet I still feel completely unmoored. And all of a sudden, I've brought this other physical body with me into the world, and I am in charge of teaching this kid what the world is and how to live in it and and thinking about you know what I want to do in the rest of my life to do that. And so there was just there was this real inflection point where because of parenthood, my body felt really porous. And because of climate change, my sense of being inside of communities and inside of nature felt really porous. And I did not know what to do with all of the things that I felt and all of the things that I was learning. And that um, my, my kid was born in summer. I was teaching in fall um, a group of public policy graduate students who were coming out of and going into government and NGOs and nonprofits and the military, all of the spaces that were supposed to publicly be taking care of this. And I was finding in our classes together that the genres that they had for containing climate change just didn't contain it. You know, they've been built to look at topics like poverty, where the effects have some kind of rhyme place to place, country to country, or where there's a clear villain outside of us um, that we can sort of write about and target. And it was really scary because I thought you're you're the people that I'm handing the future to and I'm handing my kids future to. 
And you can't even communicate with each other about this in a way that feels holistic. Um, and so there was just, there were sort of a lot of things swirling. And so it really became a deep dive on what, what is this scientifically? What is happening? What do I know? What do I not know? And then it just kept widening. So it started with sort of the science and the data. Then that pulled me into economics. Then that pulled me into sort of systems of government and ways that humans have treated each other. And I sort of started in the present moment and then was looking back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and then being pulled back into the stories in Western culture that allowed um, allowed our systems of government and economy to develop at the same time that I was trying to think forward to what what is going to happen? What is going to happen if we if we do well by each other and listen, what is going to happen if we don't? Um, and so while it started with this sort of single question of how do I psychologically live in climate change? How do I help my child through this time? It quickly felt like it sort of became almost everything in a way. Um, I don't, I, I, that's not as much about the themes, but that's sort of the, the beginning and then as I was going along, I was realizing a lot of um, a lot of it is what do we listen to and what do we silence? Mm. Um, how looking at how much how many moments in the world, how many systems in the world are disconnecting us and what is it like to try to reconnect things like reconnect our understanding of where our stories came from, where we still live in these really old spaces Um connecting ourselves to other humans across the globe, connecting ourselves through time and sort of space and objects. Um, and, and just the limits of imagination that, that as I was sort of thinking forward into what is going to happen, there's so many different paths that we can go on um, that it felt like, where does imagination come from? You know, how far can imagination go and to what extent is it bounded by the things that we already know. So how much are we just sort of stuck, stuck, stuck in the present because of the way the human brain works and um, and sort of our own histories that we're bringing into our sense of the future? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you said the word holistic um, in there somewhere. So is a holistic um, approach um, something that you feel that poetry can give to this conversation that we may or may not be having with these issues. Um, talk to me a little bit about how poetry fits in. Absolutely. So I think one of the things that I love most about art is the way that it can allow us to contain contradictions. So this is sort of, this is a situation where when we're thinking about climate change, I am both victim of it and also perpetrator in my own small way, right? I'm inside of these systems, so I can't stand outside of it. I have a lot of grief. I have a lot of hope. Those seem like opposite things. You know, I have I have anger and I have guilt. Um, there's, there's just so many spaces where it feels like um, this is this is an issue where there's a kind of constant turning. And every perspective yields a different kind of understanding. Um, there's so many contradictory emotions. And I think poetry can contain all that. You know, poetry can contain these sort of these moments that are held up against each other, almost like collage. Um, and it can knit things together. And I also, I mean, I think that there are a lot of art forms that do that. I think one of the things that I really love about poetry is that it has this very old tradition of rhyme and that we think of rhyme as being something that happens in music, mm -hmm. but that there's something about the patterning of poetry that allows us to look at something really big and see those moments of connection. Um, and I don't know, I don't know what early parenthood was like for you, but I think there were moments where I would be, you know, my daughter would be one or my child would be one and I would be watching a uh, younger set of parents in the the airport trying to sort of soothe their baby. And I could put my body in that moment. You know, I felt this sort of like, oh, there are things that I can now look at strangers and feel inside myself, which is, you know, there's problems with empathy. We can talk about that too, because I think that's a part of it. Um, but there was this vast connection. And for me, it really, it it bled beyond the human into the animal world that I'd be watching a documentary of an otter with a, baby on its stomach and I would feel my child's body on my stomach 
um, that, you know, I lived in Houston for a long time and saw, um, saw people that had, had to flee New Orleans or had been driven out of New Orleans um, living in our convention center there. And then later saw again, people from Houston driven into that convention center um, and was thinking about what it felt like to sort of see photos of those streets that I had lived in um, looking at Mumbai or Pakistan, you know, that there's there's sort of a way that I feel like rhyme allows us to knit really big things together and still find a human place inside of them. And then also, I just think the scale of this is so hard for our brains to contain. And I had so many amazing models. I mean, we were talking about Carolyn Forche earlier. I was thinking about her anthology against forgetting and her own work inside of these sort of giant political events that there's a way that poetry can look at something really big and allow us to still access the human individual feeling of it, like still put our body inside of it. Um, and so there's just, there's a lot of things that I think we need. Like we need the data, we need people that are working on laws, but we also need people that are helping us process in our bodies, in our, you know, our minds and mind as an emotional thing that are letting us really process in our cultures what is happening because that's, that's vital to us. Um, it's vital to our own sense of living through this. And it's also vital to how we are going to get out of this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it might be a good time for us to hear a poem so that okay. we um, can hear how this comes into the work. Sure. So I think I am going to read a poem called Ode to Fossil Fuels. Uh, Ode to Fossil Fuel. And I think... Um, given what we were just talking about, a way into that, a way into this might be that I had drafted so many poems in this book where fossil fuels, greenhouse gases were the enemy, where the sort of the, the businesses gathering around them were the enemy. And there was some point where it started to feel like that was too easy. And so I started asking myself, you know, this is, this, there's a reason that this is around. It's not all about it's not all about the sort of like the greed and the power structures. There's something that this has done for humans and that sort of being inside of that and really seeing it as part of laying it down as well. So this is this is the poem that came out of that exploration, Ode to Fossil Fuel. Without you, no paper in reams, no books with spines to break with use, no shirt whose blue I love against my husband's skin, eyes, no button from another country, no stitches programmed down his sides, no machine measuring my mother's heart while they cut the cancer out, no tomatoes in winter, no cheap wine, no wandering in other country's streets for a few days, no drug mules, char in a child's lungs, no miles of highway, no fast enough to break a tumbleweed, no Christmas trees in desert, no rolling blackouts, no moving away from but still keeping family, no clean and running water, no toothbrushes, no antibiotics, no grandmother's face on the phone teasing my daughter, no ballet shoes, no hothouse flowers at our wedding, no train on my dress, no desire for a train on my dress. You have made us wealthy in goods and time. Without you, no cookbooks, no inflatable pool, no water guns, no smashing the bass at the end of a concert, no MTV, no Hollywood, no Hadron Collider. You have migrated the bees on the backs of trucks. You have made cement swimming pools, a million rubber ducks, and most of the toys my daughter loves. Without you, no life jackets, no mammograms, no gas masks, no napalm, no grandmother's farm in summer, no machines to replace bodies in the fields, no wind turbines on semis across the highways. We could have known who made every object in our house. No neatly cremated bodies behind the barbed wire, the buildings, no mercury rising through the city from their burned teeth. Without you, fewer mosquitoes, no almost instantaneous history of the world in light. 
no expansion to the coast without you, no mass market guns, no 3D printers, no ultrasound of the baby's body, no landscape as a staging area for designer clothes and purses, no taking someone's acres to tunnel or poison, no carnival rides, no ice and drinks, no selling the oil and mineral rights to leave something to the next generation. Without you, no wonder, no photos of the war, the wedding, no pinata favors, no artificial heart, no snooze button. Without you, no bodies doused in flames for protest. No flying back to say goodbye to my grandparents, no flying for the funerals, no casinos, no poems scattered in dead hard drives, no soldiers on the ships and submarines sent to the sea to war, no flag in the ice, no recording under the ocean of song, no birth control pill in its oyster pink box, no women on the factory floor. No flammable nightgowns, flammable water, oil slick, yellow bright wellies, train explosion, paintings that smell like horses, fish from the ocean's middle, no quick shower before work, no Madame Curie's laboratory, no man on the moon, astronauts exploding in air, no World Trade Center, no World Trade Center falling, no fires in the oil fields, no oil spill in the water, no time down to the second, no glut of information, no newspaper on my phone, no cold waiting rooms, no pieces showing what it all adds up to. Here we are, an increased standard of living, fewer deaths in the factories, the mines, the fields, and now bear down the sixth extinction's crowning. <laughs> it's like a tsunami. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that's, that's what it feels like, yes, right? Yeah, like there's exactly. a way that that's, that's our experience of life right now. Yes. Yeah, exactly. That, that sense that, that there is no escaping it, um, that these, these moments in time are juxtaposed with one another. Um, I mean, really quite literally through the material of the things that we touch every day. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's so many, uh, so many moments in in that that poem, and I've experienced it a couple times on the page um, now. And now hearing you read it, I feel that the effect of that that listening, right, that that attentiveness to um, to each thing in in this in the midst of this swirl of the this gigantic you know movement of time and movement of history and movement of our lives. Um, it's a tremendous, uh, yeah, it's a tremendous feeling, like you said, of, of how we're experiencing um, the, I mean, the opulence, right, of our lives and also just the, uh, the inescapable information of our time as well. Yes. And there's just, there's something about, I'm, I, and this is in some ways getting back to your previous question, there's something about the attention of poetry that feels really powerful. Um, and I mean, again, it could, I don't, I don't want to privilege poetry over other art forms because I think attention is something different when it's, it's spread across time in music or in film, but there's something about the vast looking that, that can go anywhere, you know, like poetry is a very, very, malleable medium it doesn't require doesn't require a lot of supplies or a lot of other people to gather um but there's there's something about it actually I, I i may just pull a pen up here um there's an exercise that i do with my students as a way in where we just look at objects like here's the pen that we have in the classroom or here's the the lid of the pla uh, the plastic lid of a coffee cup and we just try to go all the way back into before that was an object you know what are what are the things that make it up and where did they come from and who made them and how did the object get to us? Probably across oceans in a shipping container. And then how far out can we trace where that object goes? So if it's recycled, what does it become until it starts to break down? You know, if it's not recycled, does it end up in a fish's belly? Does it end up in a landfill? And it's so interesting to do that with something like, you know, like a pen that's made of plastic that goes back into the dinosaur bones and forward two to 400 years when I can't even picture 
my offspring's offspring offspring into that space and something that's you know like a book where it's paper that's coming from the forest and then does it degrade back into the forest does it become a palimpsest of something else um and so there's just I, i'm just saying that because i feel like there's a way that poetry in the lyric space, it lets us back into these moments of our lives and shows us that, you know, those moments are where we attach to all other humans and where we attach to the histories that we've inherited. And, um, and there's just, there's such a power in that kind of looking, like just, just where I am, what, what is happening here and how is that a window? Yeah. 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 There's this, um, really compelling idea i think in 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 buddhist philosophy of interdependence and it's this sense that you know that every everything including ourselves you know depends on so many causes and conditions to to be right and you know that 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 exercise of looking out like well what does it become what has it started from um you start to very quickly see you know, what you pointed out earlier, this porousness, right? You start to experience the porousness, um, the connections between even what seem like very disparate um, instances or very disparate things. Um, and poetry allowing for that is very different, right? Than the mindset of science, which is like, no, each thing is its individual self. And we cannot, you know, we are not allowed in many instances to connect the dots between, uh, between these verticals that we've created. Yes. Right. Yes. And I mean, there's people, you know, I think about Robin Wall Kimmerer's work in Braiding Sweetgrass, where she's, um, she's a biologist and also a writer, and she's sort of showing how um, indigenous traditions, which really are science across hundreds of years, right, trying out experiments and sort of figuring out these, these planting practices work and these don't, um, but how the academy and sort of um, scientific funding sometimes can't even see those, like can't even accept that this is a possibility. And we certainly, I mean, we saw that in the way that it took so long for people, for scientists to recognize trees talk to each other, that this mycelium network is a real thing, which, you know, now in our age, we just sort of think, oh, of course, but there was some point where someone said, no, trees can't talk to each other. And that is coming out of a story, right? That's not coming out of fact. Um, and so I think that's the place where I can't do the work that someone is doing in a lab. I can't do the work that someone is doing writing laws and, and getting them passed. Um, but this idea of how do we see ourselves and what is what is what are the possible ways of being that we're open to, it just feels like that's that's the place where we really we need art. We need a lot of artists sort of saying, oh, also this. Um, yeah, and sort of and listening to you think about that interdependence, I, I would say also this is. I think why um, this is the place where I, it's sometimes a little bit harder for fiction to wrestle with climate change. So there have been great climate change novels that our Western fiction is so driven by the single protagonist and that sort of like the, the drama of it that, and that's not what we need. Like we need interdependence. We need ecosystems. We need people working together. Um, and I think the the fluidness of poetry, the fact that you can, each time you write a new poem, even in a single book, it can be a different form. It can contain different things. You can be a different voice writing, coming out of a different speaker, a different sense of self, that that, that sort of fluidity um, allows for a kind of interdependence, even in that, even in the art making, even in the book itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So maybe to take it in a slightly different direction, how did you arrive at the book's title? And I think you said you had a working title that was different. I than did. I did. So the working title for, I mean, really until right before the book was taken was Solastalgia, which is a term that was coined by Australian philosopher Glenn Albrecht to talk about this experience of in of um it sounds like nostalgia you know you go away you're you're missing your home place or you're missing a time from before but soul nostalgia is really about you're in the same place like you're in your home but environmental devastation has rewritten it around you mm -hmm. so it's like it feels 
it feels familiar, but you're also estranged, like you're estranged from yourself. Um, and I, I loved that. I loved that term when I found it because it spoke so much to what I was feeling day by day. Um, and it really, it was some moment where I thought a lot in this book about wanting to invite people in, like in the poems themselves, making sure that I was reaching out to as many people as possible. Cause you know, poetry is scary to a lot of people because it's been taught not very well, or they have ideas about sort of what it means to read a poem. Um, and, and so some of that was kind of a, no, no, we all belong here. And then also some of it was we as living people in this time, there's been so much obfuscation, like so many people trying to say fake news and climate change isn't real and global warming means we can't have a cold winter. And there's just been so much misinformation and language that it felt really important to be really direct and really as, as direct as I can be in my writing. And really, um, yeah, just kind of say, no, this is, this is, I'm, I'm paring down to the single truth. Mm -hmm. And at some point I realized that while soul nostalgia felt in some ways like the perfect emotional title for the book, it as a marker on the cover was kind of like, here's this word that no one knows, <laughs> you know, maybe this book is not for you. And then I, I, that was against the ethos of the book. So that was, that was number one that it felt wrong. Um, and then as I was writing the book, I kept writing these how to abandon ship poems, because I think I was feeling like here I am on the ship of culture in our time. And how the heck do I get off? Like, I don't, I don't want this. How do we remake things? Um, and so that started to feel really important. And then also as I was writing, there was a sense of here's the ship, let's all escape. And then I also started thinking about um, the, I think it's it's not an actual story, the philosophical problem of the ship of Theseus, which is Theseus is sailing the ship, leaves a harbor, there's a plank that's rotted, everybody replaces it, then another plank rots, the sailors replace it, and by the time they get to the next harbor, every single plank in the ship has been replaced. Is it the same ship? And so that that sort of idea felt really important because I thought, well, you know, we got here, we got here in the tiniest of increments, like lots of us doing these small things, um, lots of us accepting certain stories or passing them on or erasing others or shifting our relationship to goods um, or voting a certain way or saying, you know, this is my priority when I'm voting. And so it felt like, oh, this this is right, like this ghost of the ship of Theseus is sort of how I'm now understanding this ship of culture after feeling like I just wanted to, you know, jettison myself away. Um, and there's also, there's something about, even if you've never been on a ship, there's something that's like, that's fairly common. Like we have that in our common imagination to draw on. So it felt more communal. It felt right for the for the themes and some of the metaphors, but it also, it just, I hope is more inviting. It's still pretty dark, but that's appropriate, I think, to the material. Well, I like the directive of it too. You know, I mean, I think that poetry doesn't get enough credit for the times that it, it directs us to do something, right? Mm -hmm. And says, here's how to do this, <laughs> you know? Right. So there, there is a real approachability and, and sort of, um, you know, okay, yeah, we, we get in our, in our feed every day, we have like how 10, 10 ways to do X, Y, Z, right. And <laughs> here's something that's sort of poking that, that, that sensibility that we have, we need to know how to do things. Right. And of course, this book isn't going to literally, um, you know, but, but in a sense, there is that, that experiential part of it, right. Which is, um, how does one approach, right. How does, how does one approach, this very complex, constantly moving. I love the way you describe that, that ghost ship, right? The, um, the planks that are being replaced. And of course, our minds are, are in this state as well. We're constantly yes. having to replace, you know, this outdated uh, notion with, with one that's maybe a bit more sturdy, that one's going to rot away. And somehow we get from here to there. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I love, I love that, that title. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And that's just, there's just something really honest about that in terms of the change. And I feel like, I mean, the book is not going to tell you how to live your life. I don't think any book of poetry, no book of poetry should be the top 10 list of how to live your life. Um, but I think it does, you know, poetry is, it, it is not necessarily the place that we go for answers, 
but it can be a great place to go for really good questions. And that's sort of, I mean, if I could say, you know, again, the book itself is not directive, but if I could bring a directive out of it, I would say the way to abandon ship is really to just look at your life and figure out what ship you're on, you know, and what planks you have replaced mm -hmm. and whether you feel good about the plank that was replaced. Like, is that, is that, um, to your benefit as an individual? Is it a benefit to your family? Is it a benefit to the community? Is it a benefit to the world? You know, and where are the places where something has degraded, you know, here's this rotten plank, you've replaced it with something, but the thing you've replaced it with is actually quite toxic. And usually if it's to toxic to someone else, it's toxic to you. Um, and so I think that that sort of invitation in to think about where we are in this, um, yeah, that it's it's not, it's not a set of directions, but it is a sort of like, let's, let's all look at this together. Let's, let's really, let's be together in seeing where we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and that sense of permission too, the permission to live in complexity, I think is a big one for folks, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Because we feel that we need to have an answer or have a way or have a, you know, that, that thing that's going to, um, to fix the plank forever. Right. <laughs> and that's just not right. possible. So the more that we are able to live at those complexities and accept our situation as precarious, mm -hmm. um, I think that's a beautiful and, and necessary thing that this book mm -hmm. is doing. Thank you. And I, I mean, I think that was part of why I wrote it is, I mean, now I feel like there's these amazing models in Jory Graham's to 2040 and in Camille Dungy's work across so many books, um, in Franny Choi's The World Keeps Ending and The World Goes On, you know, that there are so many places in poetry that we can put ourselves inside of that kind of looking. Um, but when I started this, I could find so many books that were that were so celebratory and connect celebratory of and connected to nature. Like, you know, let's look at the barred owl. And I'm like, I don't have barred owls near me. I don't remember them from my childhood. This is sort of an imaginary thing. And, and I want that, but also that's not going to get us here. Or it was people that are sort of, I, I felt that sort of like, I'm living off the grid. Like I've completely fixed my life and I'm kind of coming back to tell you, you should fix your life too. And I just thought, you know, I'm in the messy middle, that there's a lot of things. If we were talking about actual carbon practices, there are things I'm really proud of. And there are things that I know are sacrifices and there are things I wish I could change, but the systems don't let me. And there are things that I wrestle with and there are sort of like, what's the, what's the right thing to do here? That there was just, there's such a, um, that just just living is a kind of complexity and that yeah poetry doesn't try to shut that down poetry says yes this is true you have you have many emotions at once you have many selves at once uh yeah the, the, we contain multitudes um we shouldn't try to contain other people's multitudes Whitman sometimes goes a little too far in that direction um <laughs> but that that as a practice is really really important um having these spaces in our lives where we don't have to have decided something we're not being convinced of something but we're we're living in in the strangeness yeah yeah uh would you like to read another poem sure um Okay, I think, um, oh, I'm gonna, yes, I, okay, so I'll, I'll read, um, I'm going to read a poem near the end of the book. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of the book is trying to, is trying to really, really see something, like really wrestle with the difficulty and kind of come to a place of understanding and acceptance and reckoning, and then the last, the very last section of the book, and I think what the next book will be so far, is trying to think, where can we remake these stories? Where can we see ourselves again? So um, so I'm going to read a poem called Storytelling. It's a conversation between the main speaker in the book and her daughter. Um, and I think it speaks to that interdependence that you were talking about earlier. So storytelling. We play a game called What is Me? I touch the air in front of her not me. She breathes the air in. Me. I put the glass in front of her. Milk. She drinks. Me. She turns the tree's lemons into herself and the dirt in the carrot's skin. I point to the sun in the sky. Not me. And to her skin where it warms. 
me. She pulls water, air, soil into, out of her body. A stranger's illness, not me. Their virus in her, me. Her body's carbon makes carbon dioxide, me. From plants that clean the air, we make a meal, me. The story I tell her burns her neurons, me. My days go into her body and come out night. In my womb, her cells became hers and grew, me. In the air, they crown and grow and compose, not me. Her flesh passed through my flesh. Her body makes mine permeable. I wish that we could, um, you know, visually represent um, some of the poems in this format. It's a little bit difficult. So, so that's uh, everyone's cue to go out and get a copy of the book so that you can see what I'm talking about in this next question, um, which is there, there are a lot of different forms, right? And, mm -hmm. and that, that permeability mm -hmm. and the porousness that you mentioned earlier, the connectivity, all of those, I think, are expressed in some of these choices that you're making in the form, um, the forms of the poem, um, poems. And um, so, for example, there are poems that have serial colons, one mm -hmm. of my favorite uh punctuation choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are poems that have midline scissuras, right? Gaps in the line, um, sometimes multiple gaps. There are poems that have, uh, uh, you know, um, slash marks and sometimes double slash marks. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about how those relate to the thematics, if they do. I mean, I, I feel sure. that they do, but yeah. Uh, yeah, just curious about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, part of um, part of being in a world of free verse is that every every tiny choice that you make in a poem from punctuation to how it visually lays out to how you're inviting silence. And I mean, all of that is making the form of it right. And that that idea that the form of the poem can open up a space for the movement of the mind across the poem or the emotion that happens across the poem or the world building that you're creating feels really important. Um, I think the colon, yes, the col this, this book is in love with the colon. <laughs> and I think part of that is that the colon felt right. Um, I love, I love in dashes and I use them a lot in my first book because there's a kind of connective element to them, but there was something about the colon that felt really right for this. And some of it is just that the colon is the punctuation of lists and that there's so many spaces where it's like, here's the list of all of the things that are coming together. Um, but there's also something about the colon that is a kind of equivalence, like this is on this side and this is on this side, and yet somehow they're connected. And it's not the period, there's not a break, and it's not the M dash, I'm not tying them together. It's just this, and then this, and then this, and then this. Um, and so the colon, uh, there's, there's a main speaker in the book. That main speaker is sometimes Cassandra, the Greek prophet who isn't listened to. And then there are some um, poems that are written by Cassandra's daughter, Cassandra's granddaughter, um, Cassandra's husband. And one of the things that I was really thinking about in the punctuation is that the colon is largely Cassandra's voice, that there's something about if we are taking everything in and thinking into the future, part of what we're doing is sort of inviting everything to be present at once. And the colon allows for that in terms of the experience of time as the reader. And so that as I was thinking about how do these various voices operate, what is their understanding of time and the world and the material they're bringing in, um, that colon and how much we allow the colon in our lives became really important for sort of the arc of the book. And then other spaces, I mean, things like the double slashes, um, a lot of it was there were places like the poem that the double slashes come in was a poem that just felt very broken to me. You know, as I was sort of writing it in a moment of, I just feel this vast homesickness and this vast grief. And the sentences are running the way that sentences do, but they just keep being impeded by this sense of fragments. So it's like, it's not fragments. It's, it's linear thought, but it feels, it feels like it's being broken in some way. Um, and then in, in that kind of trying to be really, really literal and really open, you know, there's poems like this is one of the first Cassandra poems. Um, and let me see if I can find its partner and, uh, 
oh, this shouldn't be so hard. The book's not that long. <laughs> okay. Um, and then there's a, there's an opposite motion with a Cassandra poem at the end. Um, that's kind of a winnowing out. Mm -hmm. And there are spaces where it feels like it needs to be that, like it needs to be, I need you to literally feel in your body that this is the motion this poem is making, like things are accumulating and getting to where we can't contain them in a single line in a way, or things are winnowing out. Um, or there needs to be a lot of breath because it's hard to understand these thoughts. They're coming slowly. There needs to be a breath where we take in what the poem has just said. Um, yes, yeah, so I think some of it is marker of breath, marker of voice, world building in a way. Um, and some of it came from some great advice that I had from Martha Rhodes, who was the founder and longtime editor at Four Way Books when I was very, I was just beginning this book. And I was sort of saying, you know, how do I write a whole book where mm -hmm. it's like depressing poem after depressing poem, which it didn't end up being, there's more variation. But she was talking about how even the same emotion in different forms or sort of looking at different slivers of it can be a different experience for the reader. And that kind of opened up a deeper kind of looking even at single emotions or deeper looking at um, at a single voice and what a single voice can do. And that was really helpful. That really helped me think about how to modulate the book and how to create sort of the order. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that sense that again that you're you're containing, um, you know, not not necessarily opposites, but you're containing the the complexities, right? Um, the complexities in something like grief, um, the complexities in something like, you know, maybe a more hopeful aspect, and how that uh, comes through in the form, I think, is a really interesting. Um, you know, something that I just want to encourage everyone to check out because it's, it's dynamic and it's, it's also delightful. Right. And Thank I think that you. there's room for delight in a poetry of lamentation or mm -hmm. in a poetry of, uh, you know, sort of emergency, <laughs> um, that I feel in, in some of these poems. So, uh, so I love that advice and I love that, that that's so well, um, realized in what we get in this book. Cause yeah, every poem has its own, um, unique expression of, you know, of those themes. So. Thank you, Rada. Thank you. And also, I mean, there's delight and there's also, there's such solace in learning to name a thing accurately. Like there's such solace in kind of digging deeper and deeper until we find the wisdom that feels right for us. And there's such solace as a reader in encountering that in other people's work, right? That there's something about for humans, you know, and we're working through language a lot of the time, it's structuring our brains in certain ways. There's there's something about that. This is what it this is. This is what I'm looking at. This is what we're in together. Um, that feels really deeply meaningful. So I, I know that's that's something that matters so much to me as I'm looking to other art, um, and it matters so much to me to try to find in the work. Yeah. Um, so I have one last question, and then maybe here let's hear one one last poem. So okay. my question is around the timing of this book, and um, you know there there are lots of poets out there who go very long times between books. You know Carolyn Forche who we were talking about earlier often has, you know, a decade between books. Um, and uh, it's part of her, her sort of uh, her ethics of, of poetic practice, um, it feels like. So for you, you've got about the same about a decade between um, the last book and this one. Um, do you have any thoughts on, you know, that, that slowness of process and how that might be, uh, you know, sort of an answer to this fast culture? that we live in. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's pieces where I had my daughter, so that slowed things down <laughs> for a little bit, um, or had my kid. Um, and then there was the two year wait after the contract. So, so some of, some of the things are built in, um, built in just by 
this is this is how life unfolds. Um, but no, I think with this book, I am really committed to the fact that there are certain things that I can control as an artist. I can control my craft. I can control my practice and sort of how often I'm coming to something, how regularly I'm attending to it, how much I'm seeking the things that I need. Um, but there are also things that I, I can't control. And for this, it was, I really wanted to get this right in the facts. And so there was a lot of research. And then, like I said, that research led me into different places. And so it felt really, really important coming to the material that I go beyond the human that I was when I started writing it. And that piece I didn't have control over because sometimes, you know, some poems, especially as I was going further into the project and understood the voices and the material better, some poems came fairly quickly. But there are poems in this book that the first draft was probably 2013 or 2014, and the last draft was probably 2021, right before I turned the book in, with maybe some revisions in the in the editing process, um, because I didn't know how to say what needed to be said yet. I needed to read more, have more conversations, live more, watch where you know how things unfolded over this decade. Um, I needed more time for the poem to truly become what it could be. I could have published it earlier. I think there was a workable draft of it probably in year six, but it just, it wasn't doing the thing that I'd come to it with, which is like, how do I understand this? I didn't have that knowledge yet. It was just a lot of sort of starting. Um, so it felt really important to give it the time that it wanted. I'm glad that I did that. And also, I just want to acknowledge for other people that are out there that are that do take longer in the pressure where I see I see some friends that put out books every couple of years. And I'm just like, how do you do that? That's not that's not the process for me that, you know, we, we are different creatures. We are all different creatures, even inside the same species as poets, we're different creatures. And that's OK. And that, you know, you're you have to be true to what your way of making something is. And you have to be true to the project because some things just take longer than other times. But also, I want to say there were points where I beat myself up about the idea of productivity, the sort of like, you know, what am I doing? Why isn't it faster? Why isn't it more efficient? And especially with this book, because so much of it is looking at, you know, how capitalism can really can really warp things and degrade our sense of humanity, that there was something in allowing this slowness that was also pushing back against the systems and understandings that have led us to climate change. So it felt like with this material, that slowness was in, um, in concert with the things that I was learning as a gesture towards a different way of being. But it's not the most convenient thing. You have to sort of start again and build a, you know, be like, hey, remember me? I wrote a book in 2013. Do you maybe want to read this one now a decade later? Yeah, there's there's not there's pieces of it that are not fantastic, but it it was it was right. I completely stand by it. Yeah. Well, not fantastic for the the brand culture, but yes, yes, <laughs> but exactly. Please let's, please let's have some spaces outside of that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, it's if we have only the brand culture, really interesting things can happen. But it's just that there's also really interesting things that cannot happen in that space. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of the, like sort of speed and and uh, yeah, yeah, it's we need everything. We need every every way of we need every way of being. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, well, one more poem please? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, I will leave you with a Cassandra poem. Okay. Um, and so just again, Cassandra, Greek prophet, predicted the Trojan War, completely not listened to. Does that have something to do with gender? Maybe. Okay, Cassandra. It wasn't easy to see, to say. I carried in my body all the silences. The king laughing while the men climbed out of my mouth from a wooden horse's belly. The cop who said I'd earn the hole in my door the man would punch. No one believed me the way no one believed the air. Still, I will tell you from the back of my throat the words still singeing. All these centuries, 
the gods kept churning out tragedies for us to pass by, shrug off. As they evolved, the gods learned to slow kills down below the speed of human naming. So from the inside, disintegration looks like a normal life. The gods are cruel because they are bored. They can buy anything. I have taken my voice past the threshold, past the lentil. I am speaking to you now from inside the wildfire while it burns the hair from my body. I don't expect you will listen. Mm, chills. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, Sasha, congratulations on this amazing, amazing book. And I just want to say again how much I encourage everyone to go get a copy and to read it slowly mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as I have been, you know, really savoring each each poem. Um, so for Thank people you, who Rada. want to uh, find you, do you have a website, social handles, anything that you want to throw out there? I do. My website is sashawest.net. Um, I am probably most active on Instagram at uh, sasha.s.west. And then I'm also on Facebook. I am more active now on social media because of the book than I usually am. I'm usually pretty slow on social media too. Um, and then I also just want to say for anybody that is in Texas or in the Austin area, Rada and I are reading together in September. Do you remember the date for that? Is it September? I think it's the okay. 8th or 9th. I can't. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to look really quickly because I I have loved Rada's work for so many years. I'm so excited about this. Okay, September 8th. September Yay. 8th at Book Woman. So please, please come come see us. Yes, yes. Um, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to talk with you. I hope I look forward to seeing each other in September, maybe even before. Yay.